Dan for the introduction. Um, this project that we've just completed, uh, what is it? Well, it was funded by Historic England. Their specific aims were to assess the amount of historic environment research out there being undertaken by community and voluntary groups. And secondly, the potential scholarly value that this research could offer to enhance research resources that we all use, in particular those used to support the planning system. Um, the project was managed by Ash down here, um, and I did a lot of the other work. We were helped. <laughs> Ash did the case studies, um, which are a magnum opus in themselves, and I'd encourage you all to read the report um, and, and go through the case studies, because they really bear um, reading. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to be doing mainly highlights from the survey which is the real sort of meat of the quantitative attempt to get a handle on what's going on in terms of community archaeology. So up until now, there's been a great deal of research into community archaeology. Most of it has tended to focus on outcomes for participants. How does it benefit us? How does it benefit the people involved? Um, you know, what do they get out of it? That's fantastic. It's incredibly valuable. We fully support Mike and the Council for British Archaeology's mantra of archaeology for all. But there hasn't been a lot of focus up till now on outputs, on the stuff, on the research that's produced as a result of these community and voluntary projects. What happens to all that stuff? What format is it in? Where does it go? What's its potential? Is that being realised? So that's what this project is really setting out to do. Um, as a straw poll, shout me out an answer. Uh, what proportion of historic environment research is undertaken as part of the planning system? Anyone got any ideas? 90. 90, that's the figure that we all use. 90%, <laughs> every site tour ever. Oh, 90% of archaeology is carried out by the planning system. Really, is it? <laughs> the best estimate, um, that figure, I kind of traced it back, did quite a lot of work, um, valid in as far as it goes but the data collection is very limited um, it's a figure that's nearly 20 years old anyway and the problem is that while we can quantify stuff that's being done as part of the planning system we have no idea how much is being produced as part of community and voluntary research because there aren't the mechanisms out there to systematically collect it so we did a survey how much are you doing what are you doing we got 619 responses from individual researchers, local archaeology societies, local history societies, maritime research groups, um, local building recording groups, a huge range of um, people undertaking some sort of research in the historic environment sector. Of those 619 respondents, um, over the last five years in England, they carried out a total of 3,357 projects resulting in over 5,000 individual pieces of research. Now, obviously, we got nowhere near a 100% sample of everyone out there. Using Dr. Susie Thomas's figure um, from her CBA survey that she carried out in 2009-2010, in um, and sort of adjusting that for factors that have affected the sector since 2010, we came up with a very conservative estimate that there are probably around about 1,600 groups undertaking research that falls within the definitions of the survey. Extrapolating that out, we came up with a figure over the last five years, probably around about 12,000 projects, 20,000 pieces of research and upwards. And that is a very, very conservative estimate. That's a heck of a lot of work that's being done. Where does it go? 56% of all the respondents are producing websites. There's a divide there between local history and archaeology. Archaeology-focused researchers are much more likely to produce a website. Um, almost two-thirds of them produce websites, less than half of local history societies. Digital exclusion and digital skills are an enormous factor in groups' ability to get their work out there. Um, one quote I've got... Uh, Money, experience, and confidence. The lady who used to publish has died, and we don't know what to do. There are hints of desperation coming across in a lot of these responses. That was a local history society in the West Midlands. Um, apart from websites, where does it go? 44% of people send it to an HER, or 41% to an HER, 44% to a record office or archive service. 
Only 12% currently are sending anything, uploading anything to Oasis. Again, looking at the focus of these groups, although there are many, many crossovers and few groups have a single yeah. unified history or archaeology focus, a lot of crossovers, but of those who stated that they, they best fitted the local history category, only 23% of them send their work to an HER. How are they coming up with these questions? Um, how is it getting into research resources? Well, two-thirds of people, 65%, are setting research questions at the outset of their project. Um, but only 45% are aware of existing historic environment research frameworks. Of those who are aware of them, the vast majority, 78%, are using them because they're useful. But are they in the right format? Not necessarily. And of those 55% who either aren't aware or aren't using them, why not? Well, here are a few quotes. Our primary aims are to protect local heritage and educate local population, very few of whom read academic journals. They're equating publication, dissemination, sending something to an HER, getting it into the resources with academic journals. Research questions are an academic concept that doesn't always fit well with much local historical research where the aim is to explore the past of the site and see what stories emerge. So we'll have a little fertile and then see what questions we come up with. Another one, the main purpose is not research but ensuring that heritage and archaeological considerations are integral to the planning process. That was a local history group in London. Now, integral to the planning process. Problem is, that group doesn't send any of their work to the HER. Now, what's the impact of funding and professional support? Um, if you're not seeking professional advice, you're 45% likely to send anything to an HER. Only 23% of unfunded fieldwork projects are sending an archive to a museum. Less than a quarter. What about funding? Um, impact on where it's going. If you've got no funding, no external funding, you're 39% less likely to get any professional advice or support, and 38% less likely to send your research anywhere where it's likely to get into research resources. This is especially acute in terms of setup of projects. 43% of our respondents had some funding, but most also used their own resources and relied on members' own financial resources. Now, this has a really big impact, potentially, on the danger of, of exclusion. If we're relying on people, especially in the early stages of projects, to put their own resources into developing it far enough to go for an HLF bid, that's excluding a whole raft of people right there. Here's another one. Um, professional support and advice. And this brings me to the conclusion and to the nub of the whole issue as I see it. The HER is, in our view, inadequate, with only a relatively small proportion of local fines. I confess we have been somewhat remiss in not ensuring that they are on the HER, but we nevertheless make this potential clear to the local planning authorities. Well, great, what do they care? What does a planning officer care about a local group going to them every planning application and goes, well, do you know there's a medieval village under there? It's not getting into the research resources. It's not getting into the HER. And that feeds this cycle of local frustration at official inaction. Any resource is only as good as the information it receives. Both the researchers themselves and, crucially, us, we as a historic environment sector, have to get better at being open and flexible receiving and ensuring that information flows both ways. The key issue for me is that the ability of the voluntary sector to effectively champion local heritage is being hampered. It's being hampered by confusion over roles and responsibilities. We've got to communicate and partner up better, especially in the light of diminishing local authority resources, which is meaning and we're seeing this in the survey results, that more and more is falling to commercial units, to individual freelancers. More and more responsibility is borne by people outside of local authorities. And we need to get better at networking, at supporting each other, and at ensuring that groups, people undertaking voluntary and community research are well equipped to make sure their work is heard. This matters. 
It matters because crap places kill people. And you can have all the lovely outcomes that you like. But unless the results are meaningfully incorporated into resources that make a difference to the management of the historic environment, there is no lasting benefit. The cycle will continue and the next HLF project will start from scratch with the next group of 16 to 24 year olds and we will end up spending more public money on replicating results or on producing stuff that doesn't go anywhere. This matters to the participants too. We come back to outcomes. They want research to have a lasting legacy. We have the tools to make that happen, and at the moment, it's not. There is a dazzling array of wonderful work out there, and we need to start doing it justice. That's all. Thank you.